uh, a lot of producers came to us right near the end of their production. Sometimes we saved their production because they didn't know what they want. We, you'd have directors coming in and say, amuse me, amaze me. And you didn't know whether to set fire to them or, or, or whatever. Um, but it was our particular gift, if you like, with all deference to people like Ben. Where are you, Ben? Your words come first. The, 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 uh, the, the, the wordsmiths, they, they set the scene. It, then it's us to do and the other people to just decide how big the proportions are. But we never sprung into activity unless we had a customer. So we were always having to get into their, their mind of what they thought they wanted. Sometimes we twisted it because what they thought they wanted wasn't really right. Uh, or wasn't possible to do. Remember in the first days when we worked for television and let's say Doctor Who, we worked from a script. So we'd work ahead of the studio recording only to find that what we thought was going to be our masterpiece was unfilmable, if you like, or just wasn't practical. So that ended up on the floor. Right at the end, we worked to an edited videotape of that, just the episode. Then we knew exactly what we did, had to do for how long, but we only got 10 days an episode to do it, which was fine for episode one. When you got to episode 24 or 25, you were still catching up from episodes 18, 19, 20, 21. So you were really fighting yourself. And this is where my claim to fame comes in. I was the only idiot in every story, <coughs> which was nice for me to boast about, but I was frantically trying to decide which adventure I was still on and in which direction it was going. And if I went to a television centre, I had to remember, you know, to be nice to whoever the current director was at that time. Uh, yeah, it was okay. And yet the, some of the stuff you were doing there was sort of considered, well, it certainly now is considered avant-garde, isn't it? In, in that, is that sort of, as, as far as that sort of music and sound effects were going, but, but did you regard it as such at the time? Yeah. Not really. I mean, everybody said, do you, do you realise you were a legend in your own lunchtime? <laughs> and you say, no, of course I didn't. It was a, a job. Well, it wasn't even a job to me. I hated going home about half past five because that was the time the lady over the road said, hello, had a good day today, what have you been doing? If I, I thought if I told you, dear, you'd never believe it and you'd get the chaps in the white coats to come around and take me away. Her idea, if I said Metabilis 3 to her, she would have no idea. And when you, um, did you actually in the experiment all, all the time? I mean, were you, were you constantly finding new sounds in between um, commissions, as it were? There wasn't any in between. Um, <laughs> first of all, we had to make the blessed machineries work because our, if I tell you, our mixing desk was 1943 out of the outer hall. Uh, all our sound uh, making equipment were test equipment, squeaky oscillators and things. The rest of it was tape and razor blades and a lot of creativity and a lot of BBC sound, pre-recorded sound effects. Um, Peter Grimway, he was always coming up with ideas. Good. He said, here's a tape. Uh, it's full of pig noises. I want you to make them into the marsh men language. Um, here's something else. And Tom Baker said, when Tom Baker had a habit of talking to the camera, poor soul. It's a tragic case of the Grimway syndrome. And everybody on the queue, crew knew what he was talking about. <laughs> uh, no, we never had time for separate experimentation. We always experimented in between or within the framework of whatever we were working on. Uh, of course, we all sort of uh, had lunch together. And they said, what was that you were doing as I passed your door? Then you could sort of share things with other people. But no, we didn't go in. Today I'm going to discover why a, street, a, a creaky bolt is. How much did the changing technology affect the work? It was easier, but harder. Uh, because you had the uh, facility of actually producing the sounds 
and then locking them onto some sort of time frame, which is fine. Then you went back and played them at the right soundness, sound level. Then you went back and put them left or right if it was stereo. So that was made easier by computer memory and, and things like that because for those of you who've had access to, <coughs> dare I say, illicit copies of Doctor Who uh, prior to transmission, we know they came with burnt in time code. But the time code actually drove the computer memory. So whatever you loaded into your computer kept in sync whenever you played the video backwards and forwards, which is nice. But you still had to think up the ideas. The um, BBC engineers were renowned at that, that, that period, I'm talking really like from the mid-50s to the end of the 60s, for inventing their own hardware. Oh, yes. Things like Vera and, and some cumbersome Frankenstein-like machines. That That's right. Together that was, were unique to the BBC. Our first uh, cumbersome machine was when the BBC decided it, it shouldn't really spend rent on an empty room with a microphone one end and a, and a loudspeaker the other for an echo chamber. We will devise a small echo device. They decided on a steel drum about that thick on which they painted the brown oxide stuff from a tape. The idea was you recorded onto this drum while it was whizzing round and the various replay heads, about 16 of them, could pick the sounds off later, giving you echo, depending how fast the drum was going. There was one serious flaw. People with tape machines know that if the replay head got dirty, it moved the tape away from the head and you suffered very, very bad quality loss, particularly at high frequencies. So a tape machine always had the playhead up against the tape. You couldn't put all these 16 heads up against this revolving drum to get the best quality because the thing wouldn't go round and that would defeat the whole purpose. So we were, became experts in very, very woolly echo. <laughs>